Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Unlocking California Politics. My name is Sanjay Wagley. I'm the Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the California Association of Realtors. Today, we are going to be joined by two experts who will help us explore the issues and potential solutions to the housing affordability and availability issues that face California. I'm be happy to be joined by both by Senator Scott Weiner. Senator Weiner is a state senator for San Francisco and Northern San Mateo County. <clears throat> he was elected in 2016 and focuses on housing, transportation, civil rights, criminal justice reform, clean energy, and poverty alleviation. Senator Weiner chairs the Senate Housing Committee, is co-chair of the California Legislative Jewish Caucus, and previously chaired the California Legislative LGBTQ Caucus. Prior to his Senate position, he served on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and chaired the San Francisco County Transportation Authority. Welcome, Senator. Thank you for having me. We also are joined by Dan Dunmoyer, who's the president and CEO of the California Building Industry Association. Dan Dunmoyer is the president and the CEO with extensive experience in both public and private sector. Prior to his current role, he held various leadership positions in the legislative caucus and policy committees in the California State Assembly. He was also president and CEO of the Personal Insurance Federation and served as a deputy chief of staff and cabinet secretary for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Good afternoon, Dan. Good afternoon, Sanjay. Thanks for having me. So, and uh, you can tell everybody's very distinguished because I had to read those. I couldn't memorize mm -hmm. all the accomplishments. <laughs> I'm going to start off right, right into it. So much of the legislation we've had in California in the, over the last couple of years has involved the state effectively constraining local governments or requiring local governments to take certain actions to encourage housing. There remains a lot of tension often between this action that's being taken by the state, which often is seen as an infringement or a maybe not infringement, but a, an assertion of state power over the local government when it comes to housing policies. Are there ways to solve this friction or is it frankly just inevitable? And is there more that we can do because we've passed a lot of legislation to continue to encourage local governments to stop creating impediments toward the development of more housing? And I will start with you, Senator. Great. Definitely. <clears throat> Sorry. Definitely an issue I have been around for a number of years. <laughs> and I've seen this from pretty much all angles. I, I was a neighborhood association president, then I was a local elected official, and now, of course, in the state legislature. And ultimately, we I think we need to acknowledge that, first of all, most people don't really care who's solving the problem. They just want the problem to be solved. They want their kids to be able to have a viable future in terms of having housing. They don't want their kid to go through three teachers in a year because teachers keep moving away for lack of housing. They want to they want to see pe people in their community have a place to live and have stability. And whether it's a city council solving that or a state legislature is not relevant to most people's lives. And the other reality is that the status quo for a long time was just completely untenable. We had, unlike with other critically important issues like healthcare or public education, when it came to housing, which is so important, so fundamental to human life, we had basically delegated all authority to cities. Cities could basically build no housing or build a lot of housing or a little bit or only certain kinds of housing. And it became a race to the bottom. And lo and behold, we developed a massive housing shortage. So what we've been doing for the past number of years is not to eliminate local participation in the housing process, but to set clear state standards. And then cities operate within those standards, similar to public education, with a bottom line that we have to build enough housing and that it's not sustainable economically, environmentally, socially to have a massive housing shortage. And yes, we absolutely, we're going through a, a time of tension because we're changing some long held basic concepts of local, pure local control and housing. But I, we're seeing more and more local elected officials who support that shift. And I do believe we'll get to a better place on it. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I agree with the center. I'll add a few more thoughts from a builder perspective. So we want to work with local governments. I'd say 85% of our challenge comes from local and then 10% from the state, 5% federally. So for us, when you're building a community, you want to have local input, local engagement, and you want local leaders to be supportive. 
The challenge, though, does continue. It's not the same in every city. You've got a city like Ontario or Sacramento whose mayors are working to help us build more. We have other cities, who I won't mention at this point, who we, even when we get everything approved, entitlements done, and lawsuits won, they tell us to sue them again. And that's where action and leadership from Senator Weiner and others in the legislature, both he and Senator Skinner, have put together tools and resources to, to hold the local governments accountable. It's not our preference to have that fight, but it is necessary to get to yes on housing. I think the other piece on this that would be helpful is we do like to encourage more carrots and sticks. When we do have a surplus, we love to see cities that build more, get rewarded more through other other resources, whether it's educational, transportation, whatever might be an important priority to them and others who choose not to suffer, not directly, but indirectly from lack of resources. So we would prefer the incentive approach. I think the last thing I would just say in the context of local government, local leadership is many times they will complain they don't have adequate resources to properly analyze all the different issues. And we find that really frustrating because the governor has put about a half a billion dollars in to help them do all their planning, and yet it still seems not to be enough. So we believe more accountability needs to be placed there so that, in fact, if resources have been provided, local governments need to take the time to figure out, as the senator said, how to solve the problem and to do so more effectively. So as to whether or not we need more, I think it's really just implementing the laws that have been passed and making sure the laws that have been passed are obeyed and followed. Okay. Thank you, Dan. You mentioned the aspect of carrot and stick to some extent. One of the tools which has been used more readily these days is something called the builder's re remedy to help address jurisdictions that are out of comp out of compliance with their regional housing needs element and are not complying with various laws co concerning allowing construction. Dan, perhaps you could talk a little about the builder's remedy and whether you think that is turning out to be something that's useful for your industry. It's a great tool, and it's something that does urge and push local governments to complete their arena, the re regional housing needs assessment numbers. Two things that we've found in that process and using the builder's remedy, it's still an untested tool. And so we have not had a lot of success with it yet. Theoretically, it's a great step. If you're going to put in 20% affordable, you should by right be able to build. That really hasn't happened. There's two Areas in particular, we've looked at South Bay, below San Francisco, and also Santa Monica, where we've tried to move forward, but local governments have still put impediments we don't think are legitimate or legal impediments. So this might be something we have to fix more legislatively because we spent about, one of our members spent about $600,000 trying to use a builder's remedy in a South Bay community that had no basically not submitted their arena numbers and they've decided to pull back on it because they're going to have to litigate it for oh. about three years to use something that should be a buy right process. So much of what we deal with back to local issues, the phrase sue me is used way too often where we think the law is way too clear. We seldom lose those lawsuits. It's just we spend a couple of years and a couple hundred thousand dollars winning. But if that's what it's going to take to build in a builder's remedy, and it really doesn't work. So theoretically, it's great. We'd like it to work better. We see opportunities if it gets refunded. Mm -hmm. There has to be more accountability if it's really going to work. Senator, the issue of RENA and these types of remedies, any possible further legislative error? What do you see as some of those issues? We've spent the last number of years, we, we passed a number of brand mm -hmm. new laws to accelerate housing, reform zoning, et cetera. We've also done a lot of work putting teeth into existing housing laws that are sometimes 40 or 50 years old, like the housing element, like the regional housing needs allocation, like the ADU laws or the affordable housing density bonus or the housing accountability act. These are all great mm -hmm. laws that were more or less dead letters for a number of years, put teeth into them. So we put teeth in the arena, teeth into the housing element. The fact that the builder's remedy is definitely not perfect because it's subject to CEQA. It should be more ministerial. But the fact that we're even having the builder's remedy being triggered now, that was not true before. It's happening now because it is the housing element process is much more rigorous and the state is holding cities accountable. And even though the builder's remedy isn't perfect, it's not perfect for the city either. It's a lot of uncertainty. If someone comes forward and says, I'm going to build a 20-story building in this neighborhood because you couldn't get it together 
to, or you decided not to do what you needed to do for the housing element. It creates uncertainty for everyone. We want to avoid the builder's remedy. That's the goal, not right. to have the builder's remedy. And but it, so it, it's not a perfect incentive, but it is an incentive. Thanks, Ender. And you did say, to, for the neat segue to my next question, you did say the magic word CEQA. And CEQA is something which I think almost everybody acknowledges the need for some type of reform or ways to streamline the process for particularly when it comes to the development of housing, especially it would seem in urban areas. If you could, let's see, let's start with you, Senator, if you could talk about the challenges of that and what your thoughts are about a way forward in that area. And I do know that many of the bills that I believe you have been introduced usually include some degree of trying to address some of the issues surrounding that. Yeah, well, the California Environmental Quality Act is a law. It was what, 50 years ago, Ronald Reagan signed it, and it was a well-intentioned law, but it's a very important law that that in some respects plays a very important in purpose. When you're building a project that might have negative environmental impacts, you have to analyze those so that policymakers know what they're voting on and understand the impact. And that's an important concept. CEQA has grown so dramatically over the years, and not just from the legislature, from to totally out of control court rulings. I, I will say rogue, but some not always. But there have been some truly just bizarre court rulings. It's like the, the courts are intent on just worshiping and lionizing CEQA as somehow like the core governing, like as if it were like the Constitution of California. And CEQA has gotten to the point where I like to describe it as the law that swallowed California. Everything is subject to it, and it can be, and it, it's just. It plays a role of giving anyone opposed to a project a tool to drag it out, make it more expensive, and kill it. And what, so what we've been trying to do is for environmentally sustainable projects, for infill housing, for sustainable transportation projects, for clean energy projects, they shouldn't be subject to CEQA at all. And so and we've had some success in moving in that direction. But the politics are hard. And it's not just environmentalists who defend CEQA. It's anyone who wants to be able to use CEQA to leverage a result it has a vested interest in it. We know that sometimes labor does that, but sometimes businesses do it too. We see the oil industry is currently suing Los Angeles under CEQA based on Los Angeles phasing out oil extraction in LA. So the oil industry <laughs> is relying on this law, we've seen other situations like that. And people do use it to block housing. There's no doubt about it. Um, and so I would like to see structural CEQA reform because CEQA right now is not a climate action law. It is, it can, it is regularly used to undermine climate action. And I would like to see it retooled as a true climate action law. Thank you, Senator. And it looks like you already identified the fact that there are many interests who have a vested interest in maybe maintaining the status quo there, which makes it so challenging. Just on a personal note, when I first became aware of the full scope of CEQA, and it's, so I think what the knee-jerk reaction of anybody who before learning about it is, oh, environmental protection, of course, that's a good thing. And my roots are Los Angeles. And I remember thinking, especially in certain parts of urban Los Angeles, there are no living things around here. It's like a concrete, <laughs> wow, CEQA lawsuit to stop something around here? Okay. Dan, what are your your experience with it? And I, I assume it's probably a similar view to the senator about some of the needs for reform. Very much so. So we we are very frustrated by CEQA. It does create a lot of challenges and ironies, actually. Not all of our projects are subject to CEQA, so I want to put it in its proper place. But most of our projects that are urban infill, that are near transit, that are, would be what we would call the perfect project for California's environmental and vehicle mile traveled reduction goals are the ones that are the most litigated because neighbors don't want more housing near them, or at least they don't want the housing that's necessary to achieve a price point that's mm -hmm. more attainable, which in English means to build more units. So they'll take a brand new single family detached home, but if you want to build eight or 10 units, they don't want that even though you can sell something for maybe half the price of that single family detached home and build nine more units. So for us, we know we're in California. There's no other state that has 
the complexity of CEQA that we have. They have environmental impact reports in the state of Washington, but once you do it once, you're done. So for us, some of the suggestions we brought forward to the legislature are just that. If we keep CEQA in place, let's have it so that everybody comes to the table, everyone comes to the table, raises their issues, and then once they're mitigated, we move forward with the project. Uh, with the record right now in California is 25 separate distinct CEQA lawsuits on one project, even though 90% of the land is conserved. So these are the things that add cost and delay to housing. And I'll emphasize the issue of cost. Many times we win with the CEQA lawsuits, but it takes years and years. And the carrying cost of that land with the investors means that instead of building a $400,000 unit, you're building a million dollar unit. So it's frustrating and delay, but it's also frustrating in cost. Last thing I would just say is for us on the CEQA side, if we really truly want to move forward and address the housing and policy crisis we have, CEQA has to be one of those key components. And so having the courage as the Senator does to raise this issue and address it, again, doesn't mean you have to forsake your environmental commitment. It just means you have to do it more smart, more wise, and less cumbersome. And we think that's achievable while still retaining the heart of CEQA. Thanks. Thank you. So one area that the state has made progress in is in ADU construction, which I think people forget was actually controversial when it was first being moved forward as a buy right. And now everybody takes it for granted. I think it was earlier this year in San Diego that more ADU, and this is not a good number in a way, that more ADUs were built than single family homes in one of the areas. Are there any policy lessons or legislative lessons we can learn from the success of that could be leveraged to to build more support for additional housing? And I'll start with you, Senator. Yeah, I mean, I think what's happening with ADUs is actually is what makes me more optimistic because I'm I've been around for a while and I remember when in like in San Francisco, and I think it was true in most places, ADUs were t- politically toxic. Right. Or at least the perception was because we had tens of thousands and we still do of illegal ADUs, spaces that were simply converted in, into housing without permits. And there were, had been efforts to legalize them. It always fell apart. Efforts to allow people to put in new ADUs, it always fell apart. It was just considered a problem. When I was in the Board of Supervisors, I dipped my toe in and I authored an ordinance to allow people to add an, an ADU in the Castro neighborhood only. And I'm like, let's try in one neighborhood and show this guy didn't fall and then we can move from there. And what was interesting is at the time, our neighborhood association decided to conduct a poll, like a, a online survey of neighbors, but what they thought of my ordinance. And it came back 70% support. That was literally a neighborhood association doing this, 70% support. And so we started expanding it. And and now, after a number of years of fighting about closing loopholes that cities were using to get around the requirement that they allow ADUs, now we have more and more cities who are like, wait, let us, don't tell us what to do, just let us do it through ADUs. They're not going to be able to do it only with ADUs. But the fact that ADUs have now become much more accepted, in part because homeowners realize, oh, I can put a little cottage in my backyard either for to make money off of it or for my kids or my parents or whatever, that helps. But I think it shows that the politics around different kinds of housing can change over time. Dan? Yeah, it's interesting. So to your underlying question, what can we learn from that? Two key things that have distinguished the success of ADUs, and it's really fascinating when you see it. One, the fees associated with building an ADU are radically lower than home building. And second, the permitting process is radically quicker. To us, ADUs is a great laboratory tool to show that when you address those two key components in California, you can build much more quickly and much more affordably. And ironically enough, and sadly enough, we always refer to the housing crisis as a housing policy crisis. Um, Other states do this all the time. So I'm not going to say Texas or the the volatile states, let's say Washington, (laughs) let's say Oregon, let's say New Hampshire. So these are all blue states, but they make it easier, unless you're building a historical home site in the New England area, to build with lower permit costs and lower time and delay. So that's what we've seen with ADUs. When you take away that impediment, uh, things move quickly and they move at a price point that allows people to make investments 
and to use their property more effectively and to add value to their property. And as the senator said, address family needs, especially as we used to call them granny flats for a reason, mm -hmm. but it's nice, much nicer to take care of mom in your backyard than to stick her into assisted living until she really wants it or needs it. So it can be both a great way to keep families together, but also to meet housing needs. But those two things are what's unique about ADUs. And we feel if those policy ideas, obviously you got to put some fees in, obviously you got to have some permitting, but actually you're talking open land versus someone's backyard. There should be less concern about open land than a backyard, but there is still more concern. So two, two things we've learned and two things that have given ADUs an opportunity to grow at a much better, faster pace. And so, Dan, you've touched on some of the cost issues that, in a way, have made ADUs more doable as an option to get built and to make them get built quicker. That kind of segues into our next question, which is regarding the cost. So we do need more affordable housing in the state. The state has built in a number of pieces of legislation to encourage affordable housing development. But as – and I'm not going to go through – there's a couple of infamous – cases in California, especially Los Angeles area with some of the, I forget the initiative, local initiative, but for homeless funding, where the price per unit went from 700,000 to 800,000 per unit. What are some of the impediments to getting truly afford to build, bring down the cost of some of these affordable housing units? And what are some of the hurdles there? And I'll start with you, Dan. Those two are really the key component. It's hard enough for us when we build nicer, higher end, I would say nicer, higher end market rate housing to get the neighbors to say yes, but you add the word affordable to it and it tends to bring out more NIMBYs and more control issues from local government. Again, the center has done some great work here to incentivize, to remove impediments if you include affordable, and those are positive steps can be taken, reducing CEQA, or limiting the time and permit approach. I think that's a key element. I think the other thing on cost, part of it's going to be more costly because it requires its public funds and public subsidies. It's going to require the use of skilled and trained and prevailing wage. And that adds, right now we're saying in our projects that we do prevailing wage versus non-identical homes, identical projects. It's a 28% overall cost differential, not for labor, overall cost. So you're going to add for every 500000 another 150000 in cost. If that's the public policy of the state, it's the public policy of the state. It's just going to add more cost. And so just have to recognize that if you want to lower that cost, that's one issue to address. That's a third rail issue for us in California. But I do think the permit process side, when you have these regional housing needs assessment numbers that say so much needs to be affordable, then you really need, as the local government, to find a path and determine where you want them determine how you want them. But once you set the land aside for that, then let us build them. Instead of having us go through CEQA, having us go through more permits, more hearings, more processes. And the goal of the local government leaders that are not elected, that don't want this, is just to, to delay it to the point where the builder walks away. And we do that time and time again. And that's what's sad about an affordable housing crisis as well, legally defined as well as just market rate affordable. So those are steps that could be taken to address this issue. Senator? Cutting down the process, ha having a more rational cabin process and not one that goes on forever is a huge cost saver. It's one of, one of the cost drivers when things go on for years and you have litigation and so on and so forth. So that's definitely a cost saver. Some things we can't control, like the cost of materials and supply chain issues. Right. One, one area that needs a lot more work is local fees and extractions or exactions, I should say, which can, in San Francisco, it's almost $200,000 per unit. Some cities are much less, it's all over the map. And what ends up happening is in part because we make it so hard for cities to raise revenue, it, it's easy just to put fees for transit or parks or right. schools or affordable housing, just put it on development, which makes the development more, the, makes the new homes more expensive. And so we're trying to, we're some of our Tim Grayson from the East Bay of San Francisco has really been trying to work on this issue because there need to be better constraints because that is just dollar for dollar adding cost to new homes. As I stated before, we've been seeing a lot of housing legislation in the last couple of years, but I think it's one of these things where we passed a lot has been done. And when you look at all these bills and that our organization has been involved, I know the senator, the builders, 
And I think there's always this feeling, and I realize there's a lot of external constraints, the market, financing, et cetera. But I think everybody, there's this feeling of, wow, we've passed all these bills, but it doesn't feel like there's as much movement again, as far as getting a lot more built. If you had a wish list of a piece of legislation or something that you think you could get passed, I know that's a more delicate question for you, Senator, but if there was something you think that would really move the envelope, what do you think that would what look like? Yeah. First of all, let me just say last year we did get up to about 125,000 new homes. That okay. was a pretty sizable increase. Not, it's not enough. Um, right. that was, we seem to potentially be sliding back a little this year, but the last right. year we definitely saw an acceleration. A number of these laws have, some have not gone into effect. The big one we passed last year is going into effect in a week. Right. Uh, we have other laws that have been in effect for a year or two years. And Things just take a while to get accelerated. We've seen with ADUs that it took a while for anything to happen. And now it's really, it, once people catch on, it starts accelerating. I would like to see true structural CEQA reform so that we don't have to worry about good projects getting chopped up in CEQA. It should be a law that doesn't do that. I'd like to see constraints on local fees and just a globally ministerial process where if you come in, and you follow all the rules and you check all the boxes, you get your permit quickly. I think if we do all those things, we'll impact the cost to some extent. Thanks, Sander. Dan? I just say ditto. I fully agree. So I'll just amplify a few of those thoughts. We have surpluses in state budgets. I'm thinking positive here. I know we're not there now. But one thing is on the fee side is to, again, incentivize local government. So whatever fees you collect would be 50% reimbursed. So it, it is the two things that distinguish California public policy from the rest of the nation, why we have a housing policy crisis, are the issues of fee and delays. That's where we're uniquely different than everywhere else in, in the planet. And so those are things, too, that the consumer bears in the cost, no matter what we do. If you have the $200,000 fee, the center of reference, you can actually buy a home in San Antonio for 250000 Those are numbers you can never achieve in California if you have a $200,000 fee. The delay component, we have a saying at CBA that hopefully you're the third builder. At first, when they were saying that to me, I'm like, what does that mean? It is very common in major projects for the two first builders to go bankrupt. And usually it's the third one who pulls it off because of the delay. Investors walk away, you lose all your money you put into it because you have skin in the game. It's the builder, land developer. So that delay process has its casualties it also discourages people from investing in projects they should invest in. Last thing I would just say in the context of CEQA, really in the places that you want us to build that you think would be better for the environment, for climate, for transportation, then just get out of the way. If it's zoned for housing, let us build it, especially if it checks all the boxes and location to transit, vehicle miles, travel reduction, walkability to work and to jobs then that, that is the housing that should have no review. It should be ministerial, especially if it's zoned for housing. When we look at other states, once they spend the years to go through well, weeks or months, maybe a year, to go through their review process, their environmental process, and their zoning process, once that's done, if you buy that land and it's zoned for 50 homes, you build 50 homes, there's no further debate because all that debate has occurred. And in California, once that's done, that's the beginning of the debate process. So they do this all the time in the state of Washington. They do this in the city of Seattle. So we build up there so much quicker than we do in the great city of San Francisco. And that's the difference between both progressive cities, mm -hmm. both progressive states, but there's just a different mindset on the process. And those process questions need to be addressed. Thanks, Dan. So my, the next question is a pet issue of mine, which is why is there not more high-rise development in California? So it seems, again, Los Angeles area and the downtown, very significant high-rise construction. I know in a portion of San Francisco where the Salesforce Tower, there's a lot of high-rise construction. Whenever I drive through San Jose or other areas, which are extremely expensive areas, an incredible job engines, we really don't see much high-rise developments of condos or it goes to what you were just saying about it's logical to build close to existing jobs, et cetera. What are the political or practical construction reasons or maybe market condition reasons that we don't see more high-rise development in California? And I'll start with you, Dan. It's all three. So 
if you're in a single family or a smaller community, Hancock Park, or you go through the different cities, San Francisco, single family, detached neighborhood, you just don't want them. The, you'll fight those to the death. So you have local control issues. On the cost issue, it does cost five times more to build up past six stories, just pure cost differential than a single family detached stick home. Mm. And that's because of the complexity of construction, the seismic, the cement, the steel. You can build, we're finding ways to build up to seven stories with all wood, although we're finding people opposed to that for political reasons. But it's very difficult, though. It's pretty much impossible to build anything that's truly at a lower price point that's above seven stories and less subsidized. I think the last thing is the consumer choice. During the pandemic, it was pretty much impossible to sell those homes we had there. We did reductions, and everybody wanted to move out to the middle of nowhere to buy a single-family detached. We're seeing some of that slow now. People are looking back at the urban core. But interestingly enough, as much as we thought the millennial crowd would come in and want those homes on Jay and want to have a nice loft and be in a great city like San Francisco, mm-hmm. San Jose, LA. They don't, They especially once they have a baby. So it's just one of those things we market to every component of the state, but the draw of the consumer right now, I know this isn't where the environmentalists want us to build, but a single family detached suburb. That's where we have the tr- most demand, the most interest. So there is a customer dynamic here that is just speaking very loudly. So it's those three, you touched on all of them. And that's what makes this a little more difficult. Looking at Sacramento, the famous pit, as we call it, 300 Capital Mall, it doesn't price out. There's people that make enough money in this city of Sacramento to afford it. They should in San Jose, but at this point, it's not come together. I think, I think in, especially before the pandemic, things pandemic broke the world in so many ways, but the high rises in San Francisco were, were we're doing great. The high rises in downtown LA was thriving, And so we there, there are plenty of people who want to live that way. There are people who don't, but there are plenty of people who do. And but the reason there are the cost issues for that kind of construction is Dan outlined. When we were, when I was put, authoring Senate Bill 50, which would have rezoned mm-hmm. the lion's share of the state, we were talking about four to five story buildings and there were people having a complete meltdown about that four to five stories it's not exactly a high rise if people get very weird about mixing different kinds of homes if you go to alamo square in san francisco that square to the east of alamo square are the most famous single family homes on the planet the painted ladies directly next to the painted ladies is an eight story or maybe it's even nine or ten stories i think eight story Beautiful, like Art Deco high rise, not high rise like a downtown, but it's eight stories. It's a tall building. It looks great. They mix together perfectly. It doesn't cause fire and brimstone to come down. Those are still the most famous single family homes in the world. And I think sometimes people just get used to a certain look and everything else seems bad when it's not. It's interesting you mentioned that because I, in, in terms of resistance to even four or five stories, I was talking to a realtor from the Walnut Creek area who said when the downtown, they built a series of apartments, there was so much fear and opposition to those. I think they are four to five units clustered near the BART, et cetera. And then once they were built, everybody says, oh, this is great. <laughs> this is great. It's accessible. My kids can live there. It's it now it's more attractive. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just they almost need people almost just need to see it as well. But thanks. That's actually good for me to know. As far as the resistance to high rises, before tying in with that, you've seen in a lot of areas, and I know a lot of people, and I know there are challenges to this, and so I just want to bring it up about the conversion of commercial to residential. I know a lot of people often see that as a panacea to everything, but I understand that can be very challenging. Dan, if you could talk about that. Yeah, just a shout out to somebody member of Buffy Wicks and her assembly bill 2011. And I know Senator Weiner was very helpful in the passing of that as well. Uh, that's a great law to try to make it easier to build those bills, obviously to build those projects. Two things that we found, I mean, it depends on the commercial. The idea of looking at downtown San Francisco, we're looking at that where you have vacancy rates. The challenge is just the retrofit of those buildings. It is very expensive. Think about a nice office complex. You've got one bathroom, probably not a shower. 
maybe a kitchen and one or two of the big office spaces, but most of them don't. So the basic idea of a residential structure requires replumbing, re doing electricity, <clears throat> and building an, an overall different project. So it will work in high-end communities that have high-paying jobs. So that's kind of commercial, large, tall buildings. When it comes to commercial, small, single-story there is some opportunity there in some of the galleries and some of the malls. It might actually be easier to tear them down than to repurpose them, but it will. It's price point, unless it's a really old failing mall where the, you own the land outright, you're still, it's still more expensive than taking an open piece of land and building. So we are, though, some of our builders are starting to buy some of these old, smaller malls and are looking to build on them. They've tried so far out of the state of California <clears throat> with success, and we're urging them to look at California. And they're considering it, but it is trying to find the price point where you can deliver an attainable house price for the middle class and use the commercial infrastructure to get that done. So there is some opportunity, but so far we haven't found a price point in California that really works as compared to suburban housing prices. And that's the rub. And Senator Wiener, because I know it's San Francisco. The area you represent, San Francisco, is experiencing challenges with its commercial properties. AI is coming, so maybe that'll change some of the dynamic in San Francisco, but also the nature of hybrid work, et cetera. Do you see some potential for residential conversion? What do you see some, with some of the future of the, that the, those commercial developments? I'll pause here for a second and say that I'm going to go into the coffee book publishing business. And I'm going to create a coffee table book with, that is only obituaries that have been written about San Francisco over the last 50 years. It would be hard. I'm not one of those people, by the way. It'll be, it'll be, <laughs> I know you're not, but a lot of there are people. I, there, there are, it would be hard to fit it all into one book because there are so many of them. And you can go back into the 80s saying San Francisco is dead and 90s. Our city, San Francisco, burned down. We went through the, with the epicenter of HIV AIDS. The city has been proclaimed dead and just dead for a long time. And we're going to come back. We have big problems. Fentanyl is a problem everywhere. Homelessness is a problem everywhere. It's particularly intense and visible here because we're packed in. Yes, our downtown is definitely struggling. It is going to come back. We need to, we should use it as an opportunity to say downtown shouldn't only be offices. There should be a mix of office and housing and nightlife and restaurants and retail, just like Lower Manhattan was transformed mm -hmm. after 9-11 from being dead in the evening and weekends to being an all day kind of place. I want to say that we do need to get more flexible on some of these office buildings and we should, it should be easy to convert them to housing. It can be very hard and cost prohibitive, especially with the plumbing systems being different, but there are some buildings that be, can be converted. Some high rises in San Francisco are probably gonna have to be torn down because I think when, I think more people are gonna be in the office in three or four years than now. I think the trend is trending towards back to office. It's not gonna be 2019, but it's, I don't think it's gonna be like today, but there's gonna be a trend towards high quality, newer, nicer offices. And some of the older ones are not gonna cut it. So we need to have some real flexibility in what we do with these buildings. And, and yeah, if there's an opportunity to have more of a mix of commercial and housing, that's a good thing. So we've been touching on just the construction and building of housing as a general matter of all types of housing. I wanted to specifically just look at home ownership. What do you think we, our organization are strong supporters of the California Dream for All, the down payment assistance programs. Just wondering what other things do you think can do to help encourage affordable home ownership opportunities for Californians? And I'll start with you, Dan. Yeah, we're big supporters of that too. And to see that program pretty much utilized within two weeks of opening its doors to consumers just speaks to the need for it. We do support the down payment assistance programs. What we're doing is we are working with banks and doing our own financing. So our members are trying to find ways to do buy downs on interest rates because that is an impediment. We have found that we can build that into the overall cost of housing and deliver a price point that's more attractive. So being more creative on the financing, even in a higher interest rate time. Um, I don't normally like to put specific names out there, but Wells Fargo has also been working with us that when the interest rates go down to cap them for a longer time period than 30 mm. or 60 days, oh, okay. because it takes longer sometimes to get things done. And sometimes it takes longer to get to the final completion of a project than planned with supply chain issues and other issues. That's been helpful. 
I think the other thing in the context of this is back to the fee issue. If we can get other mechanisms to pay for fees is to give the consumer back that money. So if the state were to say, hey, if you meet your arena numbers, we'll give you $25,000 off in your fees. That goes doesn't go back to the builder. It goes back to the homeowner. Um, there are ways effectively to incentivize that construction. And you get people then encouraging more construction around them. Because if we hit our numbers, we get some of our money back. And so the new neighbors usually are the first NIMBYs. Now they become the most powerful YIMBYs. So there are some other things that can be done. I think the last thing to do is just as it relates to the financing side of things is to look at just the overall fees and complexities we add just to lower the cost itself. And that Senator has touched on that as well. But for us, I keep going there because that's, again, why California is so different. So those are things that I think would make it easier to encourage home ownership. It is the best tool for 95% of us to create personal wealth and legacy wealth and to be able to help our children and our parents through tough times is through home ownership. It's great to rent. We support that too. We build almost right. 90% of the rental property in the state now, but we also know that home ownership is a great tool for economic growth and wealth creation. So those combined are really important for us. Thank you, Dan. Senator? Affordable home ownership is, in terms of subsidized home ownership, is challenging. It exists and I support it. But we had a bill yesterday in the in housing committee about JOA fees in below market rate from below market rate home ownership units because you buy below market and then there are the costs of home ownership and that can be a lot. But giving people the ability to own, I think, is a good thing. And home ownership, of course, is not just about single family homes, it's also right. about town homes and condos. And so I think. Sometimes there's this perception that anything that's multi-unit has to be rental. And rental is very important. A lot of people don't want to own or not in a position to own and or want the flexibility, although we don't give them flexibility anymore because we don't have enough homes. So if you lose your apartment, you may not be able to get another apartment. That's a whole the bigger problem. But condos and townhomes, I think, are a really important aspect of home ownership. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Yeah, we often view that as you may have heard us use the term housing ladder. That, that in certain ur- urban areas, that could be the end, of which is meaning the, the condo where you stay forever. And for many others, the town or more condo is the beginning of building to where you do want to go in the homeownership space. So I w- want to thank you both. We're out of time right now. Dan, I want to thank you so much for your insights. Senator, I really want to thank you as well for your work the, in the legislature and for coming today. And I just want to make it very clear. My wife and I, we have a five-year-old. We go to San Francisco almost once a month. (laughs) My my son loves the Academy of Sciences, Natural History Museum. So we have to make the appearance. And they finally took the mask off the Tyrannosaurus Rex. So (laughs) (laughs) so we go there. That's good. So thank you again for coming on our podcast today. Thank you. Thank you. Disclaimer, the purpose of this podcast, brought to you by the California Association of Realtors, CAR, is to provide general and educational information and opinions from a wide range of perspectives regarding politics, voting, elections, legislative issues, and more. The opinions, beliefs, and views expressed by guests or participants of this podcast are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, or views of CAR, its affiliates, their respective directors, officers, or employees. Reference to any individual or entity does not constitute an endorsement, recommendation, or any other position or opinion regarding that entity or individual by CAR. This podcast does not constitute professional advice or services of any kind. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast.